Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and the Harvard Classics Lectures, uh, Volume 5, the Emerson uh, Volume. This is lecture number 42 over Emerson's classic text, Heroism. Um, hey, if you haven't done it, I recommend that you go to the LearnStrong.net site and there down the left hand side find the Harvard Classics folder and for sure watch the lecture 35, which was my introductory lecture to Emerson. I've given several lectures now, including the Divinity School Address self-reliance as well. We now turn to heroism. Just to remind you, we're looking at Emerson from three perspectives. We could look at it from a number of perspectives, but we're looking at it from three perspectives. Emerson is teacher, as man. Here we're focusing on his biography and the things that will somehow uh, inform his life actions. We're looking at Emerson as philosopher, as idealist, as transcendentalist, as he was sometimes referred to, although as we've said, he didn't often like that term himself. And then finally, Emerson is artist, creator, and here we're focusing primarily on, uh, in our reading um, understanding of annotative levels at 2B. Just to remind, our learning theory asks us that we're always trying to connect new information to old information. So since you've been studying a number of these Emerson lectures with me, can I make this point? I recommend that now that we're working with an idea like the ideas from her heroism, that we would try to apply that to some of the knowledge that we gained in, for example, our study of self-reliance. We're going to see that some of these uh, essays, they are companion reads in many ways. Now we want to be careful to not make the mistake that some readers of Emerson made, that they judge him harshly because he'll say one thing in one essay and then he'll say a different thing in another essay. Remember what he says in Self-Reliance, he's not worried about consistencies that are especially what he calls foolish consistencies, the hobgoblin of little minds, he says. In other words, what we want to do though is try to connect ideas that we're working with, not only just Emerson's ideas, but other ideas as well that we've studied. Of course, we've got some Harvard Classic lectures and other lectures in 303 that we've already given, for example, about Plato or whatever. And so you'll notice that we come back to these ideas right over and over again. In terms of our three levels of reading, just to remind level one, what does the text say? Well, level two, what does the text mean? Here we subdivide 2A themes, messages, 2B rhetoric, that's that stuff, not what the writer says, Emerson says, but how he says it. And then finally, we're working at level 3A. How do I relate to these ideas? How do I relate to this text? We're not just simply genuflecting here or worshiping a great American writer or a great uh, writer of the world in Emerson. In other words, we're not just simply going to accept blindly that because some teacher or whatever told me that this stuff is really important, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I believe it or, or understand. No, 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 no. We want to ask this question at three, at, at level three. How do I personally relate to this? Can I find any meaning in this that actually affects me in some way, my thinking, my living, whatever? At 3A, we ask about relationships to other texts and to events in the world. And finally, at 3B, and most importantly, how do I personally relate or understand this? In terms of background information, think about this. 1841 is when uh, several of these uh, lecture or essays that we've been working with were published. 1841, think about this, 20 years before the beginning of the American Civil War in 1861. So I think that's significant. Let's kind of put that always in our thinking. Now, background information. Several things of, of importance. First of all, we got to understand Emerson's respect for a cat named Thomas Carlyle. Carlyle's really going to talk about what we often refer to as the great man theory, the notion that history is defined by the great men who have lived. Almost always for Carlyle is men, we're going to hear about the notion of the heroine and females as being heroes in uh, this essay today, and that's, that's, that's good for us, right? Um, Emerson actually met Carlyle uh, August 26, 1838, so you can kind of think about the dates there of 1841 is when this essay is published. Okay? There's a book that we will study together in our, uh, in our Harvard Classics later, Plutarch's Lives. Plutarch will tell biographies, and that's going to be hypercritical to understanding this essay. And of course, the study of biography is also uh, huge as well. So here we go. Let's go to work now. We got 19 paragraphs in this one. So this is a shorter essay than some of these others. I definitely recommend that you number those. Again, as I've said before, I lament that I can't just read in its entirety to you these essays. I don't have time. But let's begin right away. And as we open the essay and we begin right away, we begin with a quote. Um, an epigram right at the top before the essay actually gets started from Muhammad. 
the great prophet of Islam. The quote is, paradise is under the shadow of swords. It's an interesting quote on a number of counts, but I just want to pause for a moment and be amazed that an, uh, an American writer in 1841 will begin with the great prophet Muhammad. Fascinating. And of course, again, for us as readers today, for us who are engaged in attempting an integral kind of perspective, we want to appreciate disciplines and ideas that come from outside of our own culture. We want to celebrate the fact that this is where he begins. We're going to start here now with a section, and, Emer and Emerson's going to do this. He's going to quote from a section in paragraph number one from a play that he respects. This play is uh, from Field Fletcher's co collaboration of 1608 to 1613 called Four Plays or Moral Representations in One. And this section is going to come from the triumph of honor section, as we often refer to it. Now, this is a fascinating little play. You can Google it and read it on your own if you, will, if you want. We've got Sophocles, not the Sophocles of Greek drama, but the Sophocles who's the leader of Athens, and he's been defeated by the Romans. His wife, Dorigen, uh, is a strong woman in, in this uh, play. And then we have two Romans in Valerius and Marcius, and they are going to be ready to execute Sophocles, the leader of Athens. But all Sophocles has to do is ask for his life. And in the process, we've got this exchange. The wife of, uh, of Sophocles will speak, and we're going to pick up here now. She will say it this way. Um, farewell to, to her husband. They're standing together. They're about to die. Farewell. Now teach the Romans how to die. And uh, it, it's going to be interesting because Martius, the Roman conqueror, will say, Dost thou what, dost, dost know what it is to die? And then Sophocles will respond, Thou dost not, Martius, and therefore not what it is to live. To die is to begin to live. It is to end an old, stale, weary work and to commence a newer and a better. Sounding obviously like, you know, what, so uh, what Socrates might say at the end of Plato's Phaedo, right? But um, the uh, Valerius, the other Roman, will say, But art thou not grieved nor vexed to leave thy life thus? Sophocles, the leader, will say it this way. Why should I grieve or vex for being sent to them I ever loved best? Now, he says, I'll kneel with my back toward thee. Tis the last duty this trunk can do to the gods. After the execution, the uh, Roman is able to talk about how amazing the life of, Socr uh, of Sophocles and uh, Dorigen was, uh, how amazing the life of these two were. And this is going to set up for Emerson and his discussion about heroism and why heroism is important in a culture. Uh, uh, the Roman the, the Roman conqueror says, This Admiral Duke Valerius, with his disdain of fortune and of death, captivated himself, was, has captivated me. And though my arm has taken his body here, his soul hath subjugated Martius' soul. By Romulus, he is all soul, I think. He hath no flesh and spirit cannot be jived. Then we have vanquished nothing. He is free, and Marius walks now in captivity. This powerful statement of what it means to be a hero, that's how we will begin in paragraph number one. In other words, let's put it in our notes this way. Here we will see recapitulation of that idea from Plato's Phaedo, those final words of Socrates. We've given, again, an earlier lecture in the Harvard Classics on this great dialogue. The idea is you define a hero by how the hero dies. In other words, the death of the hero is going to say everything about the life of the hero. In paragraph number two, he will mention Thomas Carlyle with his natural taste for what is manly and daring in character. And then later he will mention the literature of heroism. And more particularly, we come quickly, he says, to Plutarch, who is its doctor and historian. Each of his lives, he says about Plutarch, and again, we're going to get to, uh, to Plutarch um, in uh, volume 12. By the way, Emerson does mention in this paragraph as well Robert Burns, who we'll meet in volume number six, our next volume of the Harvard Classics. Uh, but about Plutarch's life, he says, each of his lives is a refutation to the despondency and cowardice of our religious and political theorists. 
a wild courage, a stoicism. We think of Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus. We talked about them earlier, of course, in our Harvard Classics lectures. A stoicism, not of the schools, but of the blood. In other words, not something you learn, but something you practice. Shines in every anecdote and has given that book its immense fame. So let's begin here by pointing out that for Emerson, he believes that if you really want to understand heroism, you have to read the biographies, borrowing, of course, again, from Thomas Carlyle's understanding. Reading biography is huge. Of course, we've said this before, and we'll say it again when we talk level 3A in a bit, but let's go ahead and put it in the notes now. It is important to read biographies. Reading about the great women and men who have lived will give us insight into the kinds of things we most uh, should most aspire towards. Paragraph number three, he makes the observation that we need books, as I was just saying. We need models. There are a few great men, and uh, by men here, he's going to mean all humans, because he'll mention women in, 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 the, uh, in this essay, left. And they're important, in other words, for the building of a young country. And Emerson is obviously very conscientious of that one. It's important that, we are, that, we're, that we're giving um, our, our culture the opportunity. And in fact, he says it this way in paragraph four. Our culture, therefore, must not omit the arming of the man. Let him hear in season that he's born into the state of war and that the commonwealth and his own well-being require that he should not go dancing in the weeds of peace, but warned, self-collected, and neither defying nor dreading the thunder. Let him take reputation and life in his hand and with perfect urbanity dare the gibbet and the mob by the absolute truth of his speech and the rectitude of his behavior. Well, let's go ahead and say it in our notes really quickly. What Emerson is arguing for, and this will sound very platonist, is education has to be to prepare students to go out and fight in the struggle. Now, of course, war here can be quite literal war, or probably more for Emerson, metaphoric war. It's not that he hates peace, but he is going to argue that your education should be something that prepares you for the struggle, for the fight. And he says the best way to do that, to educate young people, is to show them the heroes, the, the fighters, if you will. Uh, paragraph number five, to this military attitude, he continues, of the soul we give the name of heroism. It's rudest form is the contempt for safety. Now we're getting into a definition of heroism. It's contempt for safety and ease which makes the attractiveness of war. In other words, sounding very much like Ma uh, Machiavelli and the Prince. Uh, remember there in the Prince, Machiavelli said princes should never sit around and get lazy. Bad idea. They need to be always out working, uh, training hard. It is a self-trust which slights the restraints of prudence and the plenitude of its energy and the power to repair the harms it may suffer. The hero is a mind of such balance that no disturbances can shake his will, but pleasantly and as it were merrily, he advances to his own music. This will sound very much like Emerson's uh, student Thoreau, and of course we're going to talk about Thoreau's Walden later. Uh, um, a, a man must, be, uh, must march to the beat of his own drummer, uh, Thoreau will say, alike in frightful alarms and in the tipsy mirth of universal dissoluteness, there is somewhat not philosophical in heroism. There is somewhat not holy in it. It seems not to know that other souls are of one texture with it. It is pride. It is the extreme of individual nature. Some of us will think immediately of Ayn Rand's um, important emphasis on selfishness as a certain kind of egoism uh, as, as she will present it in uh, Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. Nevertheless, we must profoundly revere it, this heroism. There is somewhat in great actions what does not allow us to go behind them. Heroism feels and never reasons and therefore is always right. And although a different breeding, different religion, and greater intellectual activity would have modified or even reversed the particular action, yet for the hero that thing he does is the highest deed and is not open to the censure of philosophers or divines. Well, we've said it before, and it to uh, be the rhetorical level, we'll say it again. Emerson loves his hyperbole, his exaggeration, his overstatement. Anything the hero does is right. Well, of course, we're, and he's going to argue, with an understanding of moderation. In other words, to be a hero that defines himself as going out to see how many people he can slaughter senselessly, Emerson will not see that as heroic. So obviously there's a bit of, uh, of debate about how you interpret these lines. Paragraph number six, he continues, heroism works in contradiction 
to the voice of mankind and in contradiction for a time to the voice of the great and good. Heroism is an obedience to a secret impulse of an individual's character. Now again, to go back to what we said earlier, that two-box theory is important to understanding the dualism that is ever-present in Emerson's mind. In other words, a hero is an individual who lives committed to understanding and participating in those virtues of the second box. There it is, we've said it, that's an easy way for us to say it. In paragraph number seven, we're going to continue. Self-trust, he says, is the essence of heroism, sounding very much again like self-reliance, the essay we've talked about before. It is the state of the soul at war, and its ultimate objects are the last defiance of falsehood and wrong and the power to bear all that can be inflicted by evil agents. It speaks the truth and it is just. Sounding very much again like Plato's Republic and the whole notion of justice. It's generous, hospitable, temperate, scornful of petty calculations and scornful of being scorned. In other words, it doesn't care if people make fun of it. Heroism. It persists. It's of an undaunted boldness and of a fortitude not to be wearied out. Its jest is the littleness of common life. In other words, it sees, it sees the silliness and doesn't want to participate in the silliness. That false prudence which dotes on health and wealth is the foil, the butt and merriment of heroism. Heroism, like Plotinus, is almost ashamed of its body. Plotinus, a Neoplatonist, who basically argues that one should spend less time worrying about the issues of the physical body, because of the issues of the physical body, I mean, everything sags and bags, as we say in 303 over time, and spend all one's time energies given to the mind. Paragraph um, um, number seven ends with a really funny kind of um, statement about how heroes could care less about the color of their socks, peach socks, for example, is what he mentions. I, I don't, I remember this, I, I, in, in the earlier lectures that I gave on Plato, I often will picture Socrates sitting at the fountain at the mall, you'll maybe remember this, and two young people walk by, and again, he asks one of them, why Amber Crombie? And again, the one wearing the Amber Crombie, carrying the Amber Crombie bag, leaves angered. But the other one, we imagine him as Plato, sits and talks. And again, that question of, why do you wear the clothes you wear? Uh, again, for Amber Crombie, Socrates may be arguing that the reason you wear that is because you can spend $100 on a t-shirt, and that sends a message to others, I can wear Amber Crombie and you can't. In other words, you're trying to somehow send a message through your garments, and here Emerson is playing a very similar kind of game. I'm not interested in the clothes you wear. I'm interested in the mind that you possess and the way you use that mind. Paragraph number eight. He says the hero, the hero does not fear others nor what others have to say, especially because others oftentimes are going to consider the heroic actions uh, in jealous ways or whatever. He, he says it this way, uh, these men, these, these heroes, fan the flame of human love and raise the standard of civil virtue among mankind. In other words, the point here being that we need heroes to hold us to a certain kind of standard, not to imitate, but to emulate. In other words, it's not that we're trying to be exactly like these heroes, but rather we're going to emulate their virtues, emulate the things that make them strong and courageous. Paragraph number nine, he talks about the power of temperance. The way he says it is a great man scarcely knows how he dines, how he dresses, but without railing or precision, his living is natural and poetic. And then he quotes John Eliot, the, uh, a, 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 a missionary to the Native Americans. Uh, we're told that he drank water instead of wine. Quote, it's a noble, generous liquor, and we should be humble, humbly thankful for it. But as I remember, water was made before it. And then Emerson even mentions um, a great story about King David when brought water, and because the others didn't have it, he poured it out. In other words, temperance, meaning don't go over bounds with uh, whatever it is that you're being heroic about. And of course, uh, uh, self-discipline, right? The ability to control one's desires. Um, in paragraph 10, and this is a, a valuable paragraph for us, um, he talks about Brutus, and we think, of course, of our study of, of, uh, of J.C., Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. It's told of Brutus that when he fell on his sword after the Battle of Philippi, he quoted a line of Euripides, a, a great um, uh, Greek dra dramaticist. Oh, quote, oh, virtue, I have followed thee through life, and I find thee at last but a shade, end quote. 
Emerson's response to this is, I doubt not the hero was slandered by this report. The heroic soul does not sell its justice and its nobleness. In other words, it doesn't matter. It's still going to remain uh, virtuous. And then it does not ask to dine nicely and to sleep warm. And then the, the most famous line of this essay, the essence of greatness is the perception that virtue is enough. Poverty is its ornament. Plenty does not need it and can very well abide its loss. Wow, that's a great line. Read it again with me. The essence of greatness is the perception, the understanding, that virtue is enough. Whoa. Now that's a line worth writing down and sticking up next to your uh, uh, maybe bed or on your wall at your, in, in your house and just look at it for a few days. Greatness is understanding that virtue is enough. You don't need anything else, right? Reminds us as well, of course, doesn't it, that whole notion of, uh, remember Thoreau, going to Walden Pond and saying, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately to front only the essential facts of life, right? That, what is the most important stuff for Emerson, sounding very much like Plato, for sounding very much like Socrates, it is virtue, right? Uh, paragraph number 11, he, he makes the importance, uh, he makes the observation that uh, you, you got to be able to laugh, and humor is a huge part of this as well. He, uh, he says it this way, the great, will, uh, the great will not condescend to take anything seriously. All, that, all must be as gay as the song of a canary, though it were the building of cities or the eradication of old and foolish churches and nations which have cumbered the world or the earth long thousands of years. Simple hearts put all the history and customs of this world behind them and play their own play in innocent defiance of the blue laws of the world. And he finishes like little children frolicking together. Now this is a compelling word picture. We'll talk about this in a moment at 2B when we ask about these word pictures that Emerson loved so much. Now, these really important virtues of strength and courage and all those things. And yet at the same time, there's got to be a joy there's got to be a levity to it all. There's got to be children playing at the park. He says it in paragraph 12 to continue about children. Young people, he says, are...